It's that time of the year again. Hasbro and Wizards said something about something, so now everyone's got to freak out and start pretending how the reserve list is going to disappear and get obliterated, and underground seas are going to be $20 after they reprint them to oblivion. Everyone just relax. The reserve list isn't going anywhere. But today what we're going to talk about is how Wizards might take lessons from the reserve list, and instead of making those $20 underground seas, we might see cards going up in price. Let's dive in. Thanks for tuning in. Steven with Magic Metal Money. Same old song and dance here. Wizards announced something, they opened their mouths, they made some type of statement, and so now people want to freak out and say the reserve list is going away. This time it was because of some corporate structure changes, which probably has more to do with accounting and finance than anything relevant to the actual direction that Wizards will be going in the future. Uh, and then the other aspect of this is, of course, Universes Beyond, the collaboration with Warhammer and Lord of the Rings and other universes and other IPs in the future. Some people want the reserve list to go away, and honestly, they look at any excuse to... <laughs> it's just pure confirmation bias. They say, oh, Wizards said something. The, the reserve list is going to go away. It's not. There's way too much risk involved. They're not going to get rid of the reserve list. Some people want the reserve list to be gone so cards can be cheap and they can reprint expensive cards. Some people want the reserve list to be grown and enhanced and improved on and more cards to be there. They've said technically they'll never add to the reserve list. I think they probably could go with that direction going back on their word, but they definitely can't go back on their word by getting rid of it. There's just too much risk. That's not what today's video is about. Now, while we know they're not gonna just straight up reprint Underground Seas and reprint Black Lotus, one thing that they could do is start to blur the lines between what a reprint really is with the functionally equivalent reprint, right? Because that's a key part of the reserve list is that they're just not just saying we won't reprint the same cards, we're not gonna reprint the same cards with the same functionality, right? So Elvish Mystic and Llanowar Elves, they're the same card, right? Everything about them the same, one green, one one, Elf Druid taps for a green mana. They have different names, they're the exact same card, so if Llanowar Elves was on the reserve list, they could not have made Elvish Mystic. And some people want to say, well, you know, they could just do snow-covered dual lands, right? Like, Underground Sea could now be Icy Tunnel. Well, if Icy Tunnel did not enter the battlefield tapped, that would be the exact same card. I don't care if one is snow mana and one isn't. And, and everyone knows that. Everyone knows that is functionally the same card. So they can't do that. So people have been exploring, well, what if they start to blur the lines and, and maybe print cards that are similar but not quite... Re reserve list you know they're functionally different and how close can they be jeweled lotus obviously brought this up and, and really brought this to light to say hey they said they never reprint black lotus and they've done plenty of you know shout outs to black lotus right we got lotus bloom and lotus veil vale and tons of other things with lotus in the name but they've never actually redone a black lotus jeweled lotus got pretty dang close right a lot of the text is the same zero mana artifact tap sack get three mana the same color that that all starts to sound the exact same but a huge crucial difference in that you can only use that mana to cast your commander okay so it's not even saying like hey you can use this card if you have a commander or if you started the game with a commander in the command zone or if you started the game with you know multiple opponents or if you have two or more opponents you know like they did with the battle bond lands and, and the, the the buddy lands you know if you have two or more opponents then you get a black lotus it just works like that it's not even that saying, hey, this is a Black Lotus you can use for Commander, it's very specifically a Black Lotus, Lotus only for your Commander. So it really is pretty narrow. Uh, if they just said, hey, this is a Black Lotus as long as you, you know, like, hey, maybe it's a three mana spell. It says cost three generic, and then they say this spell costs three less if you have three or two or more opponents, right? That would be really, really even more similar, but probably functionally different enough to say it's not a Black Lotus. But the way they did it, the lines are pretty far away. Same thing with the Buddy Lands, right? There's no way that you can do these Battle Bond Lands and actually have them be the basic land types so you can fetch them as well. It just feels too similar to the Reserve List. It would cause too much panic. I, I think it's good that they're not doing cards that close. They're trying to say, hey, we're going to make cards that are powerful and can be played, especially in Commander, right? And that's the big idea, saying, hey, no, we're not going to mess with Legacy and Reserve List because Legacy is such an old format, blah, blah, blah. It's only the classics. You know, we're not going to mess with that. But they're saying, hey, the, the, the most popular format of the game is an Eternal format, right? It is commander where you can play with any card so let's make let's make sure that we make cards that are power like they're powerful like they are with the commander or with the reserve list but for commander only 
they're still separating them. They're still not making the cards exactly the same, but with just a commander rule. They're, they're still limiting and changing the way they play, the way they, the functionality of the card, which is really good. But may they start to go the other direction? For those who want all cards to be cheap, uh, Wizards is not disappointing. They are reprinting everything. And things get printed two, three, four times. It's not just like, oh, every card has been printed. It's like, let's print Damnation in a secret lair and also in Time Spiral. And same thing with Monastery Swift Spear. Not that that's an expensive card, but just the principle that they are reprinting everything. And oh, hey, this card was only printed two years ago in Modern Horizons. All right, let's print it again, Yogmoth. Though that one, it's fair. It's fair to reprint Yogmoth. It's such an old card. It's been a flavor card for so long and it took 26 years or however long for the card to actually be printed and made and, and Yogmoth became a character. So printing Yogmoth with its own frame, I like it. I like it. It's pretty flavorful. It, it fits. This card really should have a retro frame. So Yogmoth gets a pass in my book on the reprint policy. But you understand my point. They are reprinting everything. Oh, a card hits 50 bucks, reprint it. Card hits 25 bucks, secret lair. They're, they're taking much of that, that equity on the secondary market and they're capturing it. So for those who don't like the reserve list, it's really only a few cards. Most cards in Magic, the, the Wizards is just saying, we're gonna reprint these things so no card is over $20. Now for those who do like the reserve list, whether you have a position in it yourself and you're a financial position or it's just your collectability or you think it's cool that you know you have the one and only, it's you keep the, the supply small so it actually feels like something collectible and it's not just the original version, but it's truly the only version, regardless of your reasonings for liking the reserve list, if you're someone who likes it, are there lessons to be learned from it? And I think absolutely. Wizards is realizing, hey, making a collectible card game not collectible, you're kind of losing out on, on a lot of opportunity here. And so they're tapping into that a little bit with making you know collector boxes and collector edition cards, but they're not necessarily rare or hard to get, with the exception of the full, the full Jeweled Lotus, right? Full foil, full art, everything, not just a borderless version, the real, version of this yes there's you know several different versions of jeweled lotus even though it's a brand new card but there's only one chase version that's actually hard to get and this is a direction where i think wizards really could and should go you see other games pokemon obviously pokemon is always going to be the biggest trading card game right anytime you ever mention hey i play magic they say oh is that like pokemon you're like oh no it's the og pokemon that's the og trading card game the reality is the whole world knows what Pokemon is and not the whole world knows what Magic the Gathering is. Pokemon, with the incredible price points that they have, it's free marketing. Having an expensive secondary market is good. Secondary markets, while it might look like you're losing revenue and you're losing value from the company standpoint, it's free marketing, which is huge. You get millions of dollars worth of free marketing whenever you have an expensive card in your game, right? A first edition Charizard, those get opened, those get sold, people talk about them, right? With that PSA Alpha 10 Black Lotus being sold for half a million dollars, that was great for the game of Magic. The Magic being talked about in Forbes Magazine and every other freaking website in the world. When everyone's talking about your game, and, and it's interesting to say, hey, half a million dollars was spent on a little piece of cardboard that's worth more than its weight in whatever, plutonium or whatever. Like it's, it's like, that's crazy. That's really interesting. People like talking about that and it's good for the game. Expensive cards on the secondary market, that is free marketing and that is a beautiful thing for a game. That is, it just can't be enough said. From a business standpoint, being able to have your game talked about and your product talked about for free and having people want to produce content about it, that's so good for sales and it's so good for business. You don't have to spend money. I mean, that's just incredible. Pokemon knows how to do that because they have true chase expensive cards. And same thing with you see Flesh and Blood, right? They have the cold foils that if this game survives, those cold foils are gonna go for a premium forever and it's always gonna have a chase version without hindering the playability of the game, right? That's the problem with reserve list cards is you can't really, you get priced out of playing them. But with having premium versions and variants, you don't get priced out of the game. You might get priced out of the collectability, of the bragging rights, of the ego, of the whatever, to say, hey, look at me and I have the fanciest, rarest version, 
but you can still play the game. You can still play a Jeweled Lotus. Yeah, it's an expensive card. It's 80 bucks. It's brand new and it's a hype card, whatever. But you don't have to spend $800 just to actually play it, right? You, you don't have to spend the $800 to play the game. You only have to spend the 80 which I know is a ton of money for one card, but you get the point. That could be a direction that I think Magic goes, and that creates a chase. It creates a pre, an, an enjoyable experience, right? It creates the gambler's premium on products to say, hey, yes, it doesn't really change the EV that much because they're so rare and you take a weighted average of the product, and the, the, because there's only one full art, complete, fancy, premium version in every six boxes uh, that you know really doesn't do a whole lot to change the, the average EV of each pack, but it does change the excitement level because there is a chance. So you're saying there's a chance. Yeah, one in a million. There is a chance that you could open a fancy foil premium version of this card and that changes the formula when people are having fun, opening packs, drafting, having a good time with the game, with the product, with the randomized product that it is. I could see them going more in this direction. I wouldn't be surprised to see more variants that are actually truly rare and collectible. They don't just say, you know, it's a collector's version and, and they're really easy to get. It's actually going to be rare in an actual premium. I wouldn't be surprised to see Wizards go that way, and I think it would be good for the game. 